Hello, everybody. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, property wrappers. We can start with a definition. A property wrapper is a type that wraps a given value in order to attach additional logic to it. You can see it as an extra layer that defines how a property is stored or computed on reading. Probably, many of you are already familiar with property wrappers, especially if you are using Swift UI and Combine. That's because state, binding, environment, etc., are property wrappers. But we can implement our own property wrappers without using Swift UI and Combine. How to implement a property wrapper? We can implement a property wrapper using header extract or a class. And there are only two conditions. It must be defined with the, with the attribute property wrapper, and, the, and it must have a wrapped value property. So this is an example of a property wrapper that satisfies these two conditions, the property wrapper attribute and the wrapped value. So we can now implement a property with the capitalized attribute. This is a valid property wrapper, but it doesn't do anything just yet. We have to add some logic to it. So as you, proper, as you probably guessed from its name, we want our property wrapper to capitalize all the strings that are assigned to it. To, that, to do that, we have to add a value where the string is stored, an init method, and inside the wrapped value, a set of method in order to wrap the value that capitalized the new value and store it, and a getter method uh, where the, the value is returned. We can now implement a struct with two properties annotated with capitalized parameters. Initialize the user struct with the name and surname strings, and then we can print the values of the user structure. The strings are au automatically capitalized. We can also assign a new value to the name, and also in this case, the strings is automatically capitalized. Even though name and surname are wrapper properties, we can assess them as if they were regular properties. This is the biggest advantage of using a property wrapper. We can now have evidence of that if we compare a normal wrapper with a property wrapper. This is the implementation of a wrapper that capitalizes strings. And this is the property wrapper that, that we implemented a minute ago. As you can see, the implementation is pretty the same. For this reason, convert the wrapper in a property wrapper can be very easy. But if we take a look at their usage, we can see that with a property wrapper, the syntax, is, the syntax is cleaner, and access and assignment of properties are more natural. In some, in some cases, we may need to access the wrapper instance instead of its value. This can be done through the projected value. We, we have to add a property to the wrapper um, called projected value and return self. The projected value can return any type of value, not necessarily the wrapper itself, but this is the most, the most common use. To access the projected value, we have to prefix the property, with, the property name with the dollar sign. So in this case, user dot dollar sign name, and it returned the instance of the wrapper instead of the value. A quick recap. In this first part, we have seen what, a, what is a property wrapper, how to implement, and how to use it. Its advantages in comparison with a normal wrapper, and the usage of the projected value. Now, we are going to explore some use cases that we actually use in our architecture, and that might give you some ideas for implementing your own property wrappers. A situation that you have probably come across is saving values in user defaults. 
We want to find an approach that allows us to manage the data, say the data saving in a centralized way and read and write the value easily. We can do it with a property wrapper. Let's see how to implement it. First of all, we can declare a wrapper with a generic type in order to save some different types of values. Then we need to, have to, to add the three parameters, the key, a default value, and the storage. And finally, in the setter method of the wrapper value, we can store the values for the given key, and in the getter method, we can read the value from the storage and return it, or the default value if it is nil. We can also implement a property wrapper that allows us to store codables. The wrapper is pretty the same. In this case, the generic type has to conform to, to codable protocol. And we have to add a JSON decoder in the getter method to decode the data from the storage. And the JSON encoder in the setter method to encode the new value before to store it. In order to have a centralized management, it's possible to implement a user default data source with the list of properties that we want to store in our user defaults. As we can see, the wrapper needs to be initialized with two parameters, the key and the default value. But we can initialize it also with a storage instance if we want to override it. And it's the same for codables. In this case, we declare this property as an optional array of nodes, so we can initialize it with a nil default value. Thanks to the declaration with a generic type, we can define the properties of the data source with different types. For example, a boolean, or a string, or a number. And in the case of codables, we need, we, with an, array, an array of nodes. Node is a simple struct that conforms to codable protocol. We can now start to use our data source. As we saw in the previous example, even in this case, we can access and assign values at the, of, the wrapper, of the wrapper properties as if they were regular properties. The first time we read the properties, they returns the user the default value because we have stored anything yet. We can assign, for example, some values, uh, false for his first launch or Mario to username, or also add one to our counter. And then our values are stored in user defaults. The syntax become, becomes more natural and the reading and the saving of the values in the user defaults take place transparently. And it's the same for codables. At the beginning, nodes are nil. We can assign to node an array with my first node, and then we can append the second node to it. This is very natural um, code. In this example, we introduce two new concepts. The possibility to declare a property wrapper with a generic type. This increased the generalization of our code. And the possibility to initialize the property wrappers with more parameters to increase their possibilities. The advantages of introducing a property wrapper in this case are that the storage is completely transparent. The approach is easy to use and this makes the code cleaner. We can also implement this approach also for keychain storage. The, um, the implementation is pretty the same. We have only to change the storage type and the logic inside the getter and the setter methods. Another scenario in which it may be useful to implement property wrapper is asset management. Retrieve an image from Xcode assets is not so difficult, but what we want to achieve is a centralized and an automated approach. Also, in this case, we can start by implementing a, proper, implementing a property wrapper. In this case, we have to add a init method that accepts a key that is the name of the, of the image in Xcode assets, an image function 
that returns the image for the key if exists or an empty image. And at the end, the, the wrapper value, the wrapper value that returns the result of the image function. We can also add a projected value. As we mentioned before, the projected value can return whatever you want. In this case, we decided to return the key. We can now implement a UI image property annotated with the, the image asset attribute. But in order to centralize the image asset management, we can create an enum. The asset enumeration contains the list of all our icons. With this approach, assign an image to an, to an image view becomes very easy. We have only to write asset dot and this code will help us with autocomplete. It is also possible to access the projected value that now returns the image name. In this way, we have centralized, centralized all the icons and images, and images in a single enumeration. In order to further improve this approach, we can introduce SwiftGen. SwiftGen is a command line tool that automatically generates Swift code for resources. I don't want to go into too much details, also because the next talk will be about XcodeGen, a very similar tool to SwiftGen. But I want to show you how to create automatically our asset enumeration in three easy steps. First of all, we have to install SwiftGen. There are many ways to do that, for example, Ombrew. The first step is to create a configuration file. SwiftGen config init is the command that creates it for you. This is a YAML file in which we have to configure the input path of your Xcode assets folder, the path of the template that you want to use, and the path of the generated Swift file. The second step is to edit uh, the template. The template is the stencil file that defines the structure of the generated Swift file. SwiftGen provides a default Xcode assets template file, but we have to edit it in order to create our enumeration of image assets wrapper. And the third step is to execute the SwiftGen script uh, command. The third step um, is uh, pretty simple because you have only to uh, write SwiftGen config run or SwiftGen in your command line and execute it. And then we have the asset enumeration is automatically generated in the file that we declared in the configuration file. Thanks to Property Wrapper and SwiftGen, we have now an automated and a centralized approach. We have only to add icons in our Xcode asset folder, then launch the SwiftGen command, and at the end, we can start to use our resources wherever we want. This asset management can be very useful, uh, especially at the beginning of a new project when, we ha when you have to import a lot of resources. The last use case that I want to show you is about colors. Imagine having, imagine having an app existing with this color implementation, and you want to manage the app colors according to the device appearance, for example, light or dark. You can use a kind of approach like this one, but you can also use a property wrapper. The implementation is very simple. We have to define the light and the, dark, and the dark colors, a property that tells us if the current interface style is dark, and in the wrapper, in the wrapper value, we return the, the right color in the, on the base of the property is dark. We can also add the projected value that in this case returns self. We have now to add the color attribute for every case of our enumeration, passing to it the light and the dark color. And we don't have to change anything, anything else around in our code. 
Using a property wrapper, the syntax becomes cleaner and the solution is more elegant. We can also assess the other wrapper properties through the projected value. In this case, we can, asset, we can assess the dark and the light colors in case we want to use them regardless of the device appearance. Or we can also uh, assess the property is dark, for example, if you want to know if the wrapper is using the dark color. In conclusion, we can say that uh, projected value increase the potential of a property wrapper. We can decide to use them as a regular property or assess the wrapper itself and all its properties. This was the last example, and now we can come to conclusions. In the example we have analyzed today, we have seen how property wrappers allows us to add functionality, uh, to add the functionality to our properties. So, because is is a wrapper, but we can continue to use all the properties as if they were unwrapped properties. We can say that they are also properties. But property wrappers has also some limitations. A property can have only one wrapper attribute. So we can add, for example, two or three attributes to a property. A property with a wrapper cannot be overridden in a subclass. A property with a wrapper cannot be declared in a protocol. And you have to, uh, and you have to use Swift 5.1 and Xcode 11 or later versions. The advantages of a property wrapper are that uh, they increase code reuse and generalization. They are a great way to remove boilerplate in your code, makes the code cleaner, are easy to implement, and they are completely transparent. However, that transparency can be both an advantage and, an, uh, and a liability. On one end, it enables us to access and assign wrapped properties the exact same way as an unwrapped one. But on the other end, the risk is that we will end up hiding too many functionality behind what might be a quite non-obvious abstraction. For this reason, we have to use property wrappers responsibly. We have to create a property wrapper for a specific purpose. Don't use a property wrapper instead of a function, and don't use property wrapper for everything. The risk could be to create a DSL. DSL is a acronym for, for domain-specific language. You have to avoid creating your own specific language based on property wrappers, because this is not the purpose of property wrappers. Not all the developers are familiar with them, so if you work on, in a team, not all of the, uh, of the or the people are familiar with property wrappers, so you can create some problems, and you will hide too many logic. Be careful. Use property wrappers responsibly. Thank you. <laughs>